Gunshots stunk cut. Yeah, you know that's us. Where we only speak the real and the real rock with us. Where we motivate the people and the politic on success. Oh no, we ain't DJ Kelly, but they swear we the best. Gunshots stunk cut. What's happening? It's Contrast Uncut. It's season four, episode 39. I want to give a big shout out to Uncle Snoop's Army and Bobby D Presents. I appreciate you, brothers. It's your host, Zylo, aka DJ Wine Dollars Like I Won Some Money. Today, we have a really incredibly dope special guest. She was born in the city of Angels, you know, Los Angeles, but raised in the A, Atlanta, Georgia. She's a TV producer, theater educator, activist, acting coach, author, and playwright. She is a senior producer at Fox Soul, where she has produced shows like the Keisha Cole Show, Fox Soul Deals, and you know a show I got to make an appearance on, the Mike and Donnie Show. And I got to personally connect with her where we could say we're friends, you know, but, you know, sometimes the phone don't ring all the time. But that's none of my business. She be busy. She's the founder of the Activist Theater Company, where the focus is, and I quote from the website, it's not just about producing great plays, it's about producing great people. And that sits in everyone's heart because we got to start getting back to making sure we're making great people in this world. Everyone forgets what right looks like until they see it. So let's start producing more of what right looks like. With her extensive background in theater and education, she ran it up at Georgia State University. And you see that, how we said that? She ran it up. She got them degrees. She got a Bachelor of Integrated Studies in Theater Performance, a Bachelor of Arts in Film, with a Master's in African American Studies. Everyone, be like her and run up your education. She has published projects that includes Black Matters, the play, Black Matter Poems of Perseverance, and the Black Power Encyclopedia. She embodies knowledge and power and exudes it by raising awareness in areas that needs more attention and resolution. And if you ain't know who I got on the show by now, it's all good. We got our episode to chop it up with Aubrey, Simone Williams, everybody. How you doing? I'm doing good. That was a, that was a very flattering intro. I was not expecting that thank you so much <laughs> um oh, like you definitely good. did your research I'm, I'm super super humble um but yeah so happy to be on the show and just kind of talk about my journey with you um as a friend and I know you I've had you on my show and you were able to share your experience on the Mike and Donnie show which you know my guys I love them to death so shout out to Fox so um yeah. so yeah I think my my journey started with oh, hold on hold on hold on hold on before you okay. dig into it before you dig into it before okay. we even go into a journey people got to understand that time's the most finite thing we have on this earth and i gotta tell you from the jump how much i appreciate your time for rocking with me rocking with the viewers and the listeners thank you of course of course and yeah this is a very prevalent time to talk about some of the things that you know i've been working on and some of the projects that i'm going to get into especially with what's going on with our people of African-American descent and what is, you know, has, what has transpired over the past couple of days. So it's definitely the right time to have the conversations we need to have today. You know, just in order for people to understand, number one, if you think of something, you got to think of something on how to close the idea. It's wonderful to start something, but you got to realize that you got to arrive at a destination. And a lot of the times people don't understand it's a work ethic and the greatest self-respect you can have is your work ethic. And it leads to me to, you know, what's a normal 24 hours for you, Aubrey? Um, a normal 24 hours is waking up, I usually have over like 100 emails a day because in between Fox Soul, I also have my own theater company. Um, I also micromanage, you know, everybody who I staff at my theater company on top of having to book guests, on top of having to, you know, make sure that the shows that I produce, you know, are in order. So getting up 9 a.m., doing my pre-interviews, um, writing my scripts or at least working on my scripts, talking to different people on the phone, trying to get them booked on the show, on the theater side of things, just making sure the production is on track, 
making sure my director is doing what she's supposed to do, attending rehearsals while working on <laughs> Fox so remotely on the computer, just typing, um, making sure I'm, you know, just kind of keeping everything together. And it is a lot of work to do, especially somebody who's juggling in between two industries. So typically once I'm done with that, I try to find a little space within my day to relax. Um, but with my schedule, it's kind of hard to do. So I might have like an hour or so where I might sit down and just kind of like watch a movie or a television show. And then I jump right into the Mike and Donnie show or Fox Old Deals or whatever Fox show that I am working on at, in, at that moment. And if I'm not working on a Fox show, I'm working on my theater production company. So Ooh. it's definitely a hustle. <laughs> oh yeah, no, you can part to mentalize and you priority things to a maximum. And that's something that everyone has to understand. You know, you got to have seven strings of income. And you got to create ways that we only have 24 hours to do. Yeah, and one doing... string of income is too close to broke for me. So I got to keep that money coming. <laughs> come on, come on. Facts, facts. You know, sometimes the balance is, is an imbalance for you to understand what you got to do differently. And some stuff has to go, other things get to stay and, you know, find your purpose, find your passion, fall in love with what you do. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I fell in love with theater, which is the reason that I got put on with Fox Soul to begin with. Wow. Like that's the reason why I got hired is because um, the main man at Fox Soul, James Bowes, all praises to him. He is amazing. He, um, recognized my work recognized what I was doing here in Atlanta and he was just like hey like I love what you're doing do you want to come do what you do here at Fox Soul TV so it's actually the work that I was doing here in the community with theater with healing with um theater therapy and working with different students and producing Black Matter and touring it that got his attention and put me on at Fox Soul so that's how I ended up there at Fox Digital. That is phenomenal. Whew, you dropping gems from the beginning. You said, you know what, let me go ahead and take out this 20 karat diamond, set it down from the jump, see if anyone's going to pay attention if it moves. It's moving. It's moving to your eyes. It's just up to you if you're going to understand it. Whew. That means put in work. I got a quote. Let me know how this quote relates to you. And, and we. I promise you we're going to dig into the history. But I feel like, you know, I do spiritual thing where I go and look up quotes and try to find things that speak to me. Let me know if I'm right. Let me know how it relates to you. If it doesn't relate to you, it's okay. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Let me know. I'm not afraid to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm a producer. That's right. That's right. <laughs> to the business. Here we go. Yeah, business. You can't, I mean, you can't walk around with hurt feelings. You can't, you know. Whew. You can have <laughs> stuff on your sleeve. It better not be your personal feelings. Um, here we go to quote. The failure to invest in youth reflects a lack of compassion and a colossal failure of common sense. Let them know, Coretta Scott King. Mm. That speaks volumes to me because I started off working with the youth. I actually started off um, out of college working as a theater teacher. And I invested in them not only the art form of theater, but what people don't know about theater and about film and about television is that it teaches these kids something that they can't get in a regular classroom. It teaches them discipline. It teaches them how to run a business. It teaches them how to, you know, accounting because you have to budget your shows. You have to know how to micromanage to macromanage. It teaches them if they want to go into IT, well, you have lighting there. You have lighting design. So for me, it was about not just, you know, being a theater teacher, but culminating these youths. And even if you do not want to go into my field, you're going to come out of here learning something from what I taught you, a life lesson through this, through theater. So you're going to come out with more responsible than you came in here. You're going to come out with more knowledge about accounting, more knowledge about IT, more knowledge about how to run a show or business, more knowledge about, you know, fashion design, if that's what you want to do. So culminating the youth is super important and you don't have to be in a regular classroom setting to do that. And it breaks my heart to see these programs being taken away from schools because those are the only programs 
that help these kids realize that there's more to life than just being a doctor or a lawyer. Yes. So yes. I, I definitely agree with that statement. And Coretta Scott and Martin Luther King were really um, advocates of the arts as well. So I definitely respect them and their family. See, something else that speaks out to me is, you know, growing up in, you know, poverty and, and trying to figure things out from the struggle and not getting the resources or attention that you may necessarily need and what you're gifted at. There is this thing called this box where this television, you know, where you produce at. And kids like me, kids like you, we see things that are not what we're normally used to seeing in the streets. We're not normally used to seeing in our neighborhoods or in our own community. And it creates this, you know, I don't want to say a false pretense, but it also creates a, a hope that there's mm-hmm. other things that exist that creates other awareness. And, you know, from there, that that's how I fell in love. I fell in love with trying to fall, you know, everything from TV, from sports to whatever to be in the box that escaped my reality. And from there, I, I became a kid actor and, you know, stuff didn't work out that well, but I kept on doing it. I became a thespian. I acted, directed and did all type of plays, role plays. And, you know, when I got the ability to do this interview, there was so much in common that I was like, you know, I'm gonna wait till the door gets there. And when that door opens, I'm gonna say, hey, you know, we got a lot in common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I actually, I can relate to you in the fact that I grew up, now, don't laugh at me, but I'm from Clayton County, Georgia, which is one of them, what we consider like hood rich neighborhoods. Like we weren't no, it's kind of like one of those neighborhoods where like the kids live in nice houses. They might live in two, three story houses, but they thugs. Like, like there's some really, you know, they they come from poverty. They come from parents who have who have had to suffer, and that's due to the 1996 Olympics, where everybody kind of got pushed to the South Side, which is now Clayton County. Okay. So I come from Clayton County schools. I didn't have the resources to you know, do what I needed to do. Like I graduated early, I graduated at 16 years old because that's because I pushed myself. I had to teach myself because we didn't have books. My counselor told me that, oh yeah, you're 16, but there's no way you're going to an Ivy League school. I went to a performing arts school, but it was really just them babysitting us because I didn't have a, a real chance to showcase my talent. So I took that And I said, you know what? I'm gonna turn this around into something positive. I see what this is doing to me. And I realized at a very early age that my, like we had metal detectors in our school. And I realized at a very early age that this was setting us up for something much bigger than, you know, everybody's not gonna go to college. Some people are gonna go to prison and these metal detectors are gonna be their reality. And that's what happened. And half of more than half of everybody I went to school with is still where in Clayton County. So I can relate to that on several different levels. And that's I kind of use my work to bring awareness to the fact that, you know, we have these this youth that are not aware that they're being trained at a very young age to end up in certain places. And everybody is not going to end up in a place they want to end up which is college or trade school. Some people are gonna be working factory jobs and some people are gonna be working, you know, are, are gonna end up in a jail cell because our, the bells in the school, which tell you when to eat, when to sleep, when to go outside, um, your teacher being a warden tell you when, when you cannot and cannot, can, I'm sorry, can and cannot use the bathroom. They are training you, they are training your mind for these things it's programming and then it's creating a cycle that you think is okay you think that this little cycle of of infinity is supposed to go on forever and then it takes things to break that cycle it's that old school saying is four people in the group you're gonna be they all broke you're gonna be the fifth one broke unless you know you rearrange where you spend your time at and then you can influence them by them seeing what you're doing differently and then hey they're gonna start making money yeah yeah, and I've tried my best to just kind of pull like people who I know have had certain interests or like similar interests. I've tried my best to kind of pull them out of those situations, but everybody's just kind of stuck where they are. And jo- living in Georgia and living in LA, um, I find that a lot of people in Georgia are very, very talented. We have a lot of talented people here. This is the Black Mecca, a lot of Black business owners, but we also have a lot of people who are talented but are unmotivated. 
Facts. No, look at what they did to Compton and South Central and Watts and how they had, and they moved everybody to Lancaster and Palmdale. And it's the same situation like for, for in Georgia, where they took these low income areas that are in the middle of the desert, put all these tall two-story houses and fat backyards for the low and section eight, and they putting them all together. And, you know, we're getting the roots removed and people are getting lost in the system and they'll never know that, hey, you know, in Compton, there's all these roots of rhythm and blues. And, and did you know that, that uh, uh, what should we call it? Uh, what's, why am I forgetting his name? B.B. King's sister lived in Compton and, or, or you had LL Cool J riding down the block just because he wanted to come to Compton. You had all these different things where LA was this renaissance of just love and then people found ways to get them out of there. And then you have people that held it down and that's where the real passion hits. Yeah, I totally agree. And you have, you have that here too, but I don't think it's as, especially with this new generation coming up, they don't really understand and it takes someone of our generation to teach them because right now what they have is social media. And although I do feel like they're at a place where they are, educated enough to make a difference it's just the 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 laziness the entitlement so it's like we go out we protest but then that's it we make a post about it but then that's it but what are we really doing to change our mm -hmm. dynamic for real where is there a difference being changed where you could see difference a lot of the times people want to talk about difference but what are we doing to see it and once we start to see it, then that's where the change takes effect. And, you know, I got to ask you this because I asked everyone this question, talking about the entertainment world, did the game choose you or did you choose the game? Hmm. In terms of theater, theater chose me. Um, I've been writing plays since I was about eight years old. I used to make, my mom owns the daycare center. So I used to make everybody in the daycare center do my plays. You know, I'm the owner's daughter. So you're going to do what I say. Like, you're going to be in this play. <laughs> and I would cast everybody and we would put on like a little show. So theater chose me and it was a, in a, an escape for me for various different, you know, reasons. I would say that I chose television. Mm. Um, television and film, well, I love film, but television wasn't something that I saw myself really doing, but now that I'm in it, I really enjoy it and I really love it, but it was just so different from what I was used to doing and what I've, you know, went to college for and what I was prepared for. So once I stepped into this television world and it was so different from what I had already been doing professionally and I had to basically revamp myself and relearn everything that I you know, learn to be able to survive and to be able to produce good shows. So I think for me, I, I chose television and I'm glad I chose it because it allowed me to be versatile. So now I have all three mm. and I can use all three to my advantage and I'm finding commonalities between the three. So... And see, you've been able to transfer the heat. A lot of people don't understand that analogy. When you get attention in one area and it's a connected to the same tree, just a different branch on the other side, you got to find ways to get that wind to push that fire over there so everyone else can come and enjoy the same gift that comes from the same roots. When did you recognize that, you know, that was your confirmation? That's what you're supposed to do with yourself. Mm. Um, I would have to say when I was asked to take the position at Fox. Mm. That was the real, real confirmation of affirmation. Mr. Dubo saying, here we go. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I would have stayed in my lane. Like had it not been for him, like it, I, otherwise I would have stayed, which I was comfortable with, but he's exposed me to so many different things. And like you said, that branching out, that kind of, clinging on to that different way like he exposed me to that and he's the reason why I'm he like he's literally the reason why I've been able to make so many contacts and friends such as you you know and be able to explore what I do in my own field further and mm -hmm. he wants to explore that with me so it opened his eyes to a different industry through me 
that he wasn't really privy to either, but we're trying to find a way to put the two together. So yes, yes. No, stay the course, stay the course. And that that powerful brother's word, stay the course. Because at the end of the day, once you finish that that cross line, it's another marathon that needs to be taken off from there. Yeah. I feel it's always someone that invests an idea or puts someone in a position to reach their dreams. Who do we owe to thank you for investing into your dreams? Who do I owe? Um, definitely JD, James Bose. Um, definitely my mom and uh, family members who have supported me and bought countless tickets to shows that I've done, um, have helped me out with films and, you know, just like for free, like not even to benefit off of me, but just to truly support the person who I am. And that's very, very important to me. Like once I really got into the television and film world, I found a lot of people were trying to benefit from me rather than, you know, support me. So I would definitely owe my my success and my ability to just kind of do things and, and follow through with things with J, uh, through JP and my mom. Now, you know, you can attest because you brought up something that a lot of people don't understand that people have ulterior motives and, you know, it's important to value relationships, but it's also important to dismiss a $5 friend that wants to loan, you know, borrow $5 and be loaned that every time they see you, you know, after that first $5, it's okay to say goodbye, keep it, keep it, that's you, because I'm gonna keep on moving. And then there's other times that you have relationships that get you places money cannot. What can you tell everyone about relationships and what they mean to you and your career and your growth? I would say to everybody, loyalty is everything. Um, I'm saying loyalty is everything. If you've been, it doesn't even matter if you were shooting with me in the gym. Like if you're on my boat now and you're showing you're loyal to me, you're showing, you're showing me that you're loyal to me as a friend, to my brand, we're loyal to each other, we're helping each other out. That's most important to me, um, especially when you're in a working relationship, um, when it comes to entertainment or just any relationship general, in general. If you're in a romantic relationship, loyalty should be at the top of your list. So I think loyalty and honesty to me are two of the most important things that you should take into consideration. Mm -hmm. As we're talking about these variables, these are variables of success. These are life things that go on. And these are the recipes in the gumbo pot of success for you. But a lot of the times people can take those ingredients and make their own different type of gumbo sauce and, and you know, have their own different type of meats. They could be vegan if they want to. It's all good. Do your thing. But sometimes you have to pay attention to, hey, you don't want to mix, you know, your salt and sugar because they look the same. And, and you have to know your purpose. You have to know the reason why you're making what you're making. You know, you have to know what drives you. Where does the passion come from? You know, when it comes to activist theater company, the brand embodies where passion meets purpose and growth comes out of it. A space where individuals may create material that they feel is relevant to their personal development, community and culture using their core values, acceptance, diversity, liberation and inclusion. I know this was manifested. We know the hard work you put into your education and portfolio. What can you tell the listeners about your journey to this magnificent manifestation and as well as what you pour into your manifestations? In terms of the activists? The, the, uh, the activists <laughs> and also just, you know, I, you know, as much as I wanna say that then I know you're technical. So you're like theaters here, films here, and then TVs here. But in, in our world, you know, when you have to become a different person and, and you embody that and you love it and you have to direct someone to do, you know, whatever you understand the script tells you to do, all that stuff tied in, you know, it's, it's in doing something that you don't understand you have a gift to do. When you can act like somebody else and you don't realize you're acting like somebody else, that's a gift. But a lot of times, you know, we have to put preparation to that gift. And there's manifestation and people getting visions of like, hey, I feel like I'm supposed to be talking to everybody, but they're scared to do it. They're afraid of success. And that's failure of, of, of uh, being let down is always what weighs on their success and moving forward. So they're just, you know, back where they're used to doing. Okay. And none of that affected you. Oh, no. 
So I had a lot of epiphanies <laughs> um, before the creation of the activists. I have a lot of friends who are other, um, a lot of friends who are unseen, a lot of friends who are unheard, and I fit into that category. Um, being Black and woman, for one, being a Black woman who has a mental illness, I have friends who are in the LGBTQ community. I have friends who are trans. I have friends who just don't fit in just anywhere. Um, I have friends in the Latinx community, a community. So for me, it was just a way for me to give them a voice, mm. like a voice for the voiceless. Like, come to me, tell me what you want to say, because clearly you're not being heard because they had their own projects and things that they wanted to do. But again, they didn't have that, that push through that, you know, drive to get it out because they were so scared of what everybody wanted, you know, was going to think about them and coming to them as an other and making them and helping them understand that, you know, you may be able to help somebody in the long run, which caused me to form the activist theater company and to bring them into this space and be like, hey, this is a safe space for you. You do your thing, you create whatever you wanna create and I'll be your backbone, I'll showcase it for you. And whoever likes it, likes it. And whoever doesn't, doesn't. But at the end of the day, they learn something. Mm. They're educated now because of you. They're mm. not gonna go out into the world ignorant now because of you. And they're not gonna mm. treat other people the way they treated you anymore. See, so that's how that came about. And I feel like when you said that, number one, there was a lot of passion behind that from a lot of scars that have been just sealed up in the times of you saying that. But also I feel like a lot of truth was told to you through other people because you're a great listener. You understand the values of people coming to you. And that that is all amongst being okay with, you know, voicing your opinion to people. It's okay to talk about mental health. It's okay to talk about what you're going through. You know, there comes a point where, yeah, you gotta, you know, be tough and, and carry yourself like, hey, you know, everything's all bad, but you gotta smile through it so nobody else. But then there's another point where you gotta have those moments where you talk to someone about it, you get through it. And you've been able to take that gift and apply it where people can use that knowledge and move forward and, and make a career or make a, a transition from what they're doing into something that they feel is their purpose. And I just gotta make sure I take off my hat to you, even though my hair and say, thank you, because that is a requirement to, you know, society is to leave something that you can't take with you past this life. And it's mm -hmm. the legacy. And I, you know, there's not enough people saying, thank you for putting a, the, the peelers and, and the roses inside the peelers. And we all watch them grow through that. And that's a beautiful thing every time that they 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 shed that light. Yeah, because I mean, putting your voice out there doesn't have to always be in the book. It doesn't have to always be in the speech. It can just be in the form of a short poem or a play. And you know how much people love those or a short film. And guess what? Your voice is heard now. And mm. you're going to feel so much relief. Like you just turned your struggle what you've been dealing with, like you said, for so many years into a career. And you can continue that with or without my help. So when I was reading about your uh, the Black Matters, the play, and how you took a whole bunch of these monologues and you could have them in any environment, I took a play like that was full of monologues because it was related to my life. There's like this newspaper article up here somewhere. And I was homeless my senior year in high school and living with friends and I still got straight A's. I still directed that play and I worked for the Senator and all these great things. But when it came to my chance to do a play, my thing was, let me get down to the roots of my issues where no one knows they're my issues, but this play is gonna show other people showcase it. And mm -hmm. that was my way out of saying it. And so many people received it and you know it was amazing. And you've been able to create your own now that's something that inspires me because I'm like, oh, they didn't have all my points right. And I got in trouble for changing things up. And then I realized that, hey, things are meant to be changed up because you're supposed to create it. How did you come to your levels of, hey, I need to start putting content out. I need to get these things published. I need to put a play out. I need to get this perseverance 
poems and love out. I need to get more education out on the culture. Please, please tell me where did you make the right step forward so people can follow with the left after you? All right. Um, so like I said before, I've been writing plays, like just kind of playing with it as a child. Um, and then I went to school for theater, which in my mind, I'm just kind of like, I was a little hesitant about it. I was a little worried about what my family would think. Um, graduated with a film and theater degree, um, was able to do pro some professional stuff. And it wasn't until I did my master's degree in African-American studies and I walked in and I told them, I said, I'm going to do a play for my thesis. And I come from Georgia State. Everybody is like Black Panther down to the socks. Don't nobody really know nothing about, it. <laughs> you know, they know about Black, you know, the Black arts movement and the Black art form, but that's not really their thing. They're more into, you know, other areas of research. So they all sat me down and they were like, well, it's only one person in this department that can really help you really. Um, and they just kind of put a committee together for me. So I had Dr. Sarita Davis for research, um, Dr. Akingela, who was a playwright, and then I had Dr. Um, um, Michael Samanga, who was really good friends with Amiri Baraka. Um, so they kind of got together and sort of figured out what to do with me because they were scared that my work would not go through as an academic piece of work. So I wrote the play initially as a thesis. Defending my thesis, was able to graduate. My professor sat me down and he was like, you should, you should produce this play. And I was like, uh, I don't really, you know, you know, that's gonna cost some money. Y'all gonna give me some money. Like <laughs> it costs a lot to produce a play, and you know, I don't have it out of pocket you know I'm a teacher like I'm I, I don't have no sponsors like I don't really have a whole lot of money to produce this play just you know out of nowhere um so he was like I don't care like I will help you in any way I can I just need you to produce this play so we ended up I submitted it for the Atlanta Black Theater Festival thankfully got into that festival didn't have to pay anything um, it was well received. It sold out within the first week in a smaller theater. So they moved us to the bigger theater, the 500 seat theater. And um, from there, it just kind of blew up. We started traveling. We went to New York. Um, we're supposed to be off Broadway this year, but COVID hit, of course. So that's kind of when I decided to just take this project and just push it forward. Like he was the needle that on the compass for me mm -hmm. uh, because before I wasn't really serious about putting a lot of my work out there because I felt like it wasn't good enough but he was the one that said no like this needs to be produced professionally so you need to you need to work on putting that out so it's been produced professionally we've done it maybe eight or nine times we have a show coming up very very soon so yeah people have received it very well and people have been loving it we had Fabo come to the last show and he shared his story with me. And he was just like, this is amazing. Like he, he came to the reading. He didn't even come to pool play. And he was like, yo, this is like amazing. So. So what has been your most rewarding moment so far in the industry? My most rewarding moment so far was finding my, I guess, finding my peace because once I got to the point where I was juggling theater, film, and television, I sort of became this robot. My mental health was deteriorating. Um, and I turned into a person who was not me. Um, so once I, I had to take a step back, I had to start going to therapy. Started going to therapy and I had to realize that I had to take time to really get back to being me. And that's been the most rewarding process within this industry, because in this industry, you tend to lose yourself, especially when you're working on so many things at one time. I mean, even just working with Fox, you just tend to lose yourself because it's, it's Fox. It's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, with theater, it's a lot. So for me, I was constantly getting sick. And I'm one of those people where I work and work. I'm a very high functioning 
person with a mental disorder. So I'll work and work and work and work and work and work. And then I'll get really, really, really sick and I'll get, I'll pass out, have panic attacks, blackout, get up, work and work and work and work and work. So for me, my most rewarding moment was to find that peace and say, okay, sit the hell down. You got this. You have a staff on one end. You have Fox who supports you on the other end. Relax. You got this. That was the most rewarding point for me because had it not been, I would have spiraled out of control and I don't know where I would be today because I've been on literally been on eight medications since January. So I probably would not have been here. Mm. You know, I personally am going through that stuff right now where I'll be catching myself and just spiral sometimes. And I work 14, 16 hours a day, come home three, four o'clock in the morning, get up at six to make sure my kids see me in the morning before they go to school and just keep on going and going and going. And just because, you know, opportunities are rare as money on the ground. And at some points when you have none, you're looking for every dollar you can find when it comes to opportunities. And you spread yourself so thin that you won't recognize yourself. You won't recognize your own thoughts. You'd be like, damn, did I really just say that? And when those moments hit, that's when that's a red flag of like, okay, I need to sit down. And I'm grateful you were able to sit down. I'm blessed that I'm able to hear you say that because it's resonating with me that I need to sit my ass down sometimes. And you losing yourself. Like I literally almost lost myself. Not even, not playing no games. Like I lost myself as a person. I was losing myself mentally. Like I was not the same individual and no money is worth that. Never, None. never. You know, they say a mind is a terrible thing to waste. The worst part is, is you're at the pinnacle of what you want to accomplish. And what is the point of what you're willing to risk? And when you get those two things mixed up, you, you, it's, it's, you know, it's a fatal attraction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's important that we raise awareness on this because as much as your dreams matter to you so much, so much does that sleep matters to you because it's very rare that that 1%, 2% chance is going to affect the 98% others. The 90% others have to sleep like everybody else and get up and work hard and do it again the next day. And that's just a reality. Mm -hmm. What yeah. is, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, what is a few things people got fucked up about producing a show, a TV show? Up, what do you mean? Like, got fucked up you mean like misunderstand about producing yes yes oh my god um i think they feel like it's easy to do like this is my first time so i'm relatively new to television i'm about almost two years in i have 17 years of theater experience which again totally different totally different things they think it's easy to do. Like, I just go in, you know, I write a script, I get the host ready, I get the guests ready, that's the end of my day. No, like there are so many other little minute things. Like, you know, we might have like six, six meetings just from corporate. You know, I have to talk to the guests. I mean, you know, you have to talk to the guests. I have to do the little Zoom tech meetings. I have to do the pre-interviews. You know, it's a lot that goes into my day and that's all day. Even with theater, when I'm producing a show, like I have to find, you know, with it's theater. So nobody is gonna, you know, it's either, it's gonna come out my pocket or it's gonna come from an arts donor. So I'm finding sponsors. I'm, you know, making sure I have vendors for the show. I'm talking to, I'm talking to different spaces where the show can be produced at. Like I'm casting, helping casting folks. I'm, you know, I'm just all over the place, you know, do just micromanaging everybody. So I think that's the one thing that people don't understand about my job. And one thing that I want other people to understand outside of being a producer is when you're coming to a producer about something, just be really delicate especially when you're pitching just being just being really delicate just because we receive literally like over 100 emails I know I get at least 100 emails when I'm working on especially Mike and Donnie I was getting like 100 emails a day like I can't get 
20 emails about the same pitch. Because mm. at some point, I'm just not going <laughs> to, like, once I see it three times and, and I got it on my checklist and you done sent it 15 more times, I'm just not going to, like, I can't, like, mentally, at that point, I can't get to you. So, Rightfully you know, so, things like that, just being very delicate because producers have a very hard job. We also have to write scripts. We also have to come up with topics every day. You know, it's a talk show. We, we have to come up with topics every single day. And you know, how, how much shit can you talk about every single day? <laughs> like, you know, so it's, it's difficult. It's difficult, but we're doing it. We're killing it. So. so as we went on this side of the spectrum, let's go back to the right side of the spectrum. What's your top three favorite episodes you produce? Any show? Or, you know, if you want to, yeah, let me, let me stick to just that. I would say all of them would probably be in the Mike and Donnie arena. Um, I would say one is a sports one with Big Baby and Jay Ray, the fanatic. Just, I like the sports episodes. I think they're, I think they're freaking hilarious. Um, Big Baby is a fool, as I'm sure you know. (laughs) Um, so it had to be that one. It had to be the one with um, Leon and um, the guy who directed Five Heartbeats. And I feel so embarrassed. That I do not know his name right now, but it's slipping my tongue. Um, that episode. And then we had another one, Ladies Night, the one that we most recently started doing. Because the guys like that. You know, the guys are like really into like having ladies on a panel. And the ladies are kind of like schooling them on no, like this is what you have wrong about relationships. This is our take on it. And it kind of got Mike and Donnie like, and you know, when Mike don't have a whole lot to say. <laughs> yeah, he's learning, he's learning. <laughs> yeah. He's taking mental notes to bring back home to his wife so he can fight right. fair. Right, right. But she, Cynthia probably already got a lot down, but yeah. Um, no, she, uh, those are probably my top three is probably going to be like our ladies night, our sports, and then, um, the episode with, uh, with Leon was, was really, really good. Uh, just because I'm a huge fan of his actor wise. He's a, he's a great actor. No, dope, dope. Okay. I'm going to take a pause on the entertainment oh, question. The, huh? The parenting show. You, oh. you were on the parenting show, right? Yes. 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 That show too. That show was funny. Oh, Lord. Shit, they didn't even realize that, you know, I was a multi-ethnicity to the end. And yeah. that, that, that caused a whole, like, thing in That's the house. a whole different conversation. <laughs> Man, it was like, we were talking about parents, and it was like, hold on. You're white. What? You mix with white. That Fuck parenting. Let, let's talk about this. Yeah. But that's nor here nor there. That's genetics and how you was raised. And, and I got a whole bunch of things mixed in me and I'm blessed. And But that was a dope, incredibly dope opportunity. I I can't wait to come back on. Let me plant that seed. So yeah, I got, how are we doing on time? I know I just ran up 40 minutes like it was nothing. Well, I don't know. I haven't been keeping time. Okay, well, on that note, I'm gonna keep on going. I got two <laughs> segments. <laughs> uh, two segments. Okay, I got two. Later. Okay, bet, bet. I'm sorry to everybody that had to wait. Y'all get my personal apology on the show. Y'all just have to come to the show, click on it, and then get the apology and cut that out. All right, boom. Uh, so my next segment is my awareness segment. Knowledge is power, but when you use that knowledge, it becomes a superpower. There's no greater time to use a superpower than dealing with the police. And I like to ask every guest of mine, when the red and blue lights hit, the high beam hits the back of the neck, and we hear the blurb sound, we're getting pulled over. When was the last time you were pulled over? And what's some insight, some information to give to the guests, the listeners, on what they could do in the situation so that they can get out of it as quickly and safely as possible? And which, you know, sometimes is really challenging no matter what you do. I would say it's different for, for girls. Um, but I would say I do have, I have several male siblings. Um, my brother's are very Gen Z, 21 Savage. They they into that hole. That's what they look, that's their look. That's what they look like. Um, so they've been pulled over. They've been harassed, but we've given them that conversation of, hey, when you get pulled over, 
you know, make sure your hands are on the steering wheel. Don't move unless they ask you to. Make sure you're being respectful. Even if you don't like the tone, just make sure you're being respectful because I'd rather you come home and be safe than you die, you know, because a police officer felt like you were taking a certain tone or you were reaching to somewhere you weren't supposed to reach to or, you know, whatever the case may be. Mm. Um, so that's kind of the conversations that we have. And my brother has a hot boy car, like he got a Camaro. So I, t and I told him, I said, please do not get that car. That's like the number one car. They look <laughs> like they pulling you over when they see that car. So uh, I told him, I said, you need to be super, super careful, super respectful, super compliant, because the last thing I want to hear is a phone call saying that something happened to my brothers. So, and all of them got hot boy cars, all of them do. So um, for me, the last time I was pulled over was Christmas of this past year for speeding. Um, he gave me a warning. Um, and I think it's just because with women, typically, I think they're a little bit softer. I was pulled over by a Black police officer. They're a little bit softer on us. Um, I'm not a bad looking woman. I think I was dressed up that night for a Christmas party. Um, he was an older man. He was just kind of like, it's Christmas. You're my, my daughter. You know, you're not drunk, you know, whatever. I'm just going to give you a warning and, you know, just kind of sing you. Well, he didn't give me a warning. He gave me like a... Um, he knocked the, uh, what is it? The points on the speed limit down. Cause I was only going like two points over the, maybe like two, no, I'm lying. I was going like five to 10 over the speed limit, but he put it like two, like mm -hmm. two. So he was like, this is just a warning. Please get home safe. He was like, um, it's a lot going on. So I'm just going to give you a pass. And then the time before that, I got a, I just got a warning. I got pulled over. Guy looked at me. I was super compliant. He was like, okay, where are you headed to? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I was just headed home. He was like, all right, bye. <laughs> so I think for girls, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit different than it is for men. I think a lot of police are intimidated by men and, and black men specifically. Mm. Thank you for being transparent and also giving your testimony because one, it's it's something that happens and a lot of the time people have to just hear what to do, know what to say, or at least get the right idea of what you're supposed to do. Put your pride to the side and get through it as quickly as possible. And for you being a lady, you put a whole bunch of education to me because I didn't know it was that easy. I need to start being in the passenger seat. Yeah. I mean, like for us, like the Christmas party, I was, I mean, let's just be honest. I was scantily clad. It was a Christmas party. So, <laughs> I mean, he was just kind of like, he was an older dude. He was like, uh, like you kind of remind me of my daughter. Like, I don't want to see, like, just go home. Like, <laughs> just go. <laughs> like, I don't want to see you get in trouble. You ain't got nothing on your license. Just, just move. Just bye. So no, that's cool. That's cool. Those are rare, but also those are the type of stories that need to come out too because those are good judgment calls. Mm -hmm. I got my next segment. It's called Impulse q and I got impulse questions I wrote down earlier, but you don't have the, the ability to say you can write down your answers later because I want your impulse answer. You got to answer three questions. You don't like the question. It's all good. Just say pass. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Question number one. What's the funniest thing you've seen happen on the stage in theater? Well, it happened to me. I got my period on stage, but I laughed about it. Mm. That's why I was TMI for the audience, but it was like, you can see it. You know what? I think you would do great at doing like horror films just because you thought that was hilarious. I'm pretty sure the scariest was, movies I mean, make you laugh. I like laugh to cover up the embarrassment, but like looking back on it, it was funny to me. Like. I, because my theater community was so close, like we didn't get, like all of us have had like moments, like we had people fall off stage before. We didn't have people do some crazy stuff. We didn't have people pee on themselves because they was nervous. Like, <laughs> question, question, who did you call or did the community come to help you? Cause I, my wife hits me with this all the time. Like, you know, when your daughter period come, she's gonna call you, you know? I and somebody. I went to the back and changed my costume. Mm. <laughs> question number two 
What is one thing you love, but you wish you hated? Mm, one thing I love, but I wish I hated, um, chocolate. Mm. Is there a specific type of chocolate or just? No chocolate, um, just because it triggers my migraines. Yeah, let's keep that chocolate away. Question number three. You have traveled the world. What is one place you recommend everyone tries to at least travel to one time in their life? Oh my God, Scotland. Scotland? Game of Thrones on crack. It's the most amazing place. Like all the inspiration from Harry Potter came there. It looks like Game of Thrones. <laughs> if you are any type of nerd like me, Scotland is beautiful. It's peaceful. You also have that urban piece of it where it's like, you know, it's still nestled in like, these very old buildings, but you have your shopping, you have your H&M, your Fairfax 21, but then you can go over here and go to your like little boutiques that you won't find anywhere in the world. Mm. Um, very picturesque. Um, if Did you you're stay in a castle? Huh? Did you stay in a castle? No, but there are a lot of castles there. And then another place is London because I, I lived in London. So I'm kind of like biased to it, but I wouldn't, if I were to recommend people to go somewhere just for the first time, and it would be Scotland. Go to Scotland first and then go to London. London's more like America. It's, it's very, it is very modern. You know, so I don't drink beer, right? But I was told that they drink warm beer on a regular and that's their thing. And it's just like, that don't make no kind of sense. What else they drink warm? That's cold. But that's, that's just me talking shit, but that's here nor there. In London? Yeah. Is that not um, true? I mean, yeah. I drink warm beer because of that. I, I went to London when I was, well, I just started drinking beer at 16 because I was at Clark, but I was drinking it cold. But when I went to London, um, I was able to drink beer. I think was, I might have been like 20. Um, but I think the age there is like 18. Mm. And yeah, it's like warm or like lukewarm. They don't chill their beers. It's kind of gross to me now. Yeah. See, I'm not with that. On that note, you have survived my awareness segment. You have survived my impulse Q&A. As a reward, the floor is yours. Let's shout out the website, theactivistperform.com. Black Matter Play coming in Atlanta, April 3rd to the 5th for three days. Like, you know, whatever you're trying to do. I know I just plugged your stuff, but you can plug it too. It probably sounds way better you saying it anyways. Oh, yeah. Well... I think you have some old dates that's that was before corona hit april 35th so it's actually february 27th through 28th see let me know yeah february 7th through 28th is when the full play will hit we just had a reading um and yeah it's gonna be dope i'm not directing it this time thank god i'm only producing it my director she's like hella abstract she's gonna find a way to pull all of the monologues into one story which i'm interested to see because they they're not supposed to be like that but she has a way of like she's dope sydney prather tiny theater company check her out and i give her flowers because i saw some of her work and i was like can you do this with black matter and she was like yeah <laughs> i was like okay whatever so i'm not concerned about her Bet, bet. Aubrey, you notice that this show is different. It's a little unique. They got segments over there. And I'm like, I do segments, but I'm not going to do segments like them. And I'm like, how do I keep that same energy and close out? The viewers knows it's coming. I'm going to hit you with it. You got any questions for me? Um, Other than when you're going to come back to Fox Soul? Nah, yeah. not really. Do you drink? I mean, hey, you got to try warm beer. So just let me know. Shoot me a text when you uh, try some warm beer and let me know if it changes your mind. I've tried warm beer just because, you know, when you get to college, I went to UC Santa Barbara. And the first thing you try to do when you get to school is try to find some alcohol, some liquor. And then you get around somebody that's older than you and they think that shit's funny to have. All, that's the only beer we got. And then your gullible self gonna go run to the table and drink it. And he spit that shit out because it don't taste right. And you think all beer don't taste right. And then that's why I don't drink beer today. No, you have to drink. I mean, when it's in a keg, it's warm. I, I, was, a, I was a Hooters girl too. So I was drinking beer all day long. Whew. That's Whew. how I got the hot shift because I didn't like men trying to holler at me the whole time. That was my job throughout undergrad and grad school. 
I managed a restaurant for like seven years and made them a whole bunch of money. And then it wasn't until God made me so uncomfortable that I was going to do some shit and sit down. And it was like, you know, is that worth it? And then I got into it with the owner and then yeah, it was over. I was out that thing. And then I have not looked back and it's the greatest thing ever for me because when you start to live your purpose, you start to see the passion. You actually start to see the whole point of why you're living. And that I want everyone to be able to understand and, you know, embrace it. Don't be afraid of what's the fire inside. Sometimes, you know, ice and fire make a cold, cold smoke. And that smoke sometimes will blow over everything that you need to get out of your life. Uh, you know, I want to give a big shout out to Uncle Snoop's Army and Bobby D Presents. I appreciate you, brothers. I wouldn't be able to do incredibly dope stuff like, you know, interview Aubrey on season four, episode 39, and talk about her history. And she let them diamonds go. She was blinging with them gems. I'm talking about, and if you wasn't shooting in the gym with her, it's okay. You're going to have to buy a gem from her later on. You understand me? Look, if you wasn't shooting in the gym with me, you, I'm going to be like Mariah Carey. I don't know you. Whoo! Let's go ahead, sip on that tea, girl. On that note, I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Aubrey. So, Aubrey Williams, I'm tuned into Contrast yeah. Uncut with my man, Tylo. Shouting out to Snoop Dogg and Bobby D, who I also have the opportunity to work with. And, um, we rocking it out. Told us how to beat the projects and tell my story over beats and it could be a project. Look, how it all begun. Uh, bum, skibbity, bum. Yeah, grew up on that Nas, on that L, on that pun. Old so when I was young. Crisscross, make them jump. Battle rap for respect, my nigga. This ain't what you want. Can I kick it when I'm rhyming? Be a legend through Ebonics. Was a sticker boy. Felt like sticky. Man, I know you guys can't smell this right now. And I ain't talking about none of that other stuff. I'm talking about some of that good stuff, that smell good stuff. I think it's breakfast. What time is it? It's breakfast time. Make sure you tune in to Contrast Uncut no matter what you're doing. Whether you're eating breakfast, you're smelling good food like I'm smelling, or if you're smelling other stuff, we're good to watch too. Make sure you tune in. Thank you.